chosen to nurse our grief for the loss of dear ones with the bitterness of those who weep without hope or faith in your saving love, Christ have mercy. If we put the saints on highest pedestals and restrict ourselves to a diminished respect for our own capacity to grow in the knowledge and love of God, Lord have mercy. Let us take this time of silence for self-examination and personal confession. God of love, we thank you for your patience. You have given us many guides and helpers to inspire us, and have given us the word that one day we shall be as Christ Jesus is. Forgive us, empower us, and renew our good intentions. Through Christ Jesus our Savior, amen. We are a forgiven people. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's word for the people of God, reminding us that God offers us forgiveness. Amen. May the peace of God be with you this morning. From wherever you're seated, please let us wave at one another in Christian love and acknowledge each other's presence. Um, we welcome you to the house of the Lord. As always, it is a true source of joy to be able to claim this space as sacred, as our spiritual home, where we can connect with God and with one another through worship and fellowship and service. Um, are there any special announcements in the life of the church this morning? Anything you want to call to our attention? I hope you read our newsletter faithfully. Uh, as we know, uh, in a couple of weeks, we will be holding our congregational meeting. That gives us an opportunity to explore our budget going into next year, as well as to share with you the new leadership of the church and any new developments that 
um, you should be aware of. And we, you know, as always, are open and receptive to your feedback. I have a special announcement. It's Pastor Luis's birthday this morning. Oh, yeah. 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 Are you he's turning 40, is that correct? Oh, God bless you. Can't you can confirm it. Great musician and therapist as well. That's all I'm saying. of my heart always be pleasing for, to you, O oh God, my Savior. Amen. Have you ever wondered why a certain person has been placed in your life? Or how different your life would have been had you not met a person who is now deceased? These questions were asked and addressed and addressed in a nuanced way by Mitch Album in his popular book, the five people you meet in heaven. If you have read this novel, you may remember that the book follows the life and death of a ride mechanic named Eddie. Eddie dies in a freak accident and is sent to heaven, where he encounters five people who had a significant impact on him while he was alive. There's a lot of good theology embedded in that book. For instance, I took away the idea that we are part of a broader fellowship of faithful people who touched our lives through their saintly devotion and deeds. Today is All Saints Sunday. We take time as a community of friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, to remember how the people who were placed in our lives were a witness to faith and how their lives were an instrument through which God blessed us. Some of the saints who were placed in our lives lived long enough to know how they helped us grow or accomplish a goal. While some of them did not, then there are other saints who came into our lives for a brief period, a pain point visit in our lives. But yet we remember their words, we remember their values, and like a pebble that was tossed on a lake, their contribution to our well-being continues to ripple. So on this sacred day, I remember and uphold the memory with you of those who touched us. In particular, I remember a doctor who knew me from the moment I came from Puerto Rico to Jersey City at the age of one, who then as a middle-aged man became a pastor. He felt the calling to not only address 
the healing of the body, and also the healing of the soul as a minister. He became a surrogate father to me, someone who gave me advice that has guided me through life. And I remember one day, I came to church on a balmy summer evening, because Pentecostals not only worship on Sundays, they worship at least five days a week. And they keep track of your attendance. And if you slide to a category where you are inactive, you're put in the department of being a cold Christian, and there's a lukewarm Christian, and then those who are on fire for Christ. So I went to church both out of gratitude and perhaps a little Pentecostal guilt. And I didn't have time to go home to freshen up and change. I was wearing a suit. I was drenched in sweat. I was uncomfortable, feeling icky, and I was annoyed. I was working as an intern for my local congressman. I walked into the service, and my pastor noticed that I was upset. He pulled me aside and said, what's going on? He said, well, it was a long day at the office, and I didn't have time to take a shower and look my best for the Lord. He says, you're not coming to a, a fashion show. You're coming to worship. Come as you are. And he quoted from Psalm 55 that a broken and contrite heart the Lord will not despise. Now, he was also a practical man. He says, you may not want to blend in with the youth today and sit in the back of the church and worship by yourself. <laughs> he was very practical about it. But then he also said to me, I am really proud of you that you're going to work wearing a jacket, a tie, and you look your Sunday best even during the weekday. He goes, well, you know, the other interns are showing up to work as if they are going to a park or a picnic. And he said to me, a habit does not make you a monk, and it distinguishes you. And that advice he gave me was a prelude to having the congressman staff picking me and another intern to be the only ones to remain after the summer internship to work on the more serious and more important stuff involving policy. So his advice helped me, not only that time, but it has helped me through countless opportunities when I've had to interview, and I didn't show up looking to the interview as if I were going to a picnic at a park, but I'm here, I'm dressed to succeed, as they say where I come from. How about you? As you think about the saints who God has placed in your life, a mother, a Sunday school teacher, a deacon in the church, a favorite teacher, how have their insights, skills, values, and wisdom guided you to be where you are in life? This is why we celebrate All Saints Sunday. As I look into your eyes, because I can't see your complete faces as a result of the mask, I do get a sense from looking at your eyes that there are people who you can publicly share, if you have the opportunity, how they touch your life and contribute to your well-being. So on this All Saints Sunday, it is a day where we praise God for God's blessed work in our lives to those who no longer are physically among us. It is a day where we recognize how we are one with God and how we are one with them who dwell in heaven. We remain connected to their sacred memory as a result of their enduring values, wisdom, and legacy. Now, over the years, I have had the opportunity to talk with you briefly regarding All Saints Sunday. It is not one of those very strongly promoted liturgical days in the Reformed tradition. And some of you, in fact, have expressed a discomfort with having the word saint attached to a deceased relative. Now, this is in part because our understanding of the word saint comes from the canon of our Catholic brethren. Therefore, we think of a saint as someone who lived a perfect life, or someone who performed supernatural miracles, or someone whose pictures are depicted on stained glass windows, or were a byproduct of a sculptor's imagination who created a statue of them and has them elevated on a pedestal. But the word saint in the biblical Greek comes from the word hagos. That word hagos influenced the English word santos. Did I get that right? Truly in Latin? More or less close? Not sure. <laughs> saint. And in the Bible it means to be a person who lives separate away from the world's values. 
It was so commonly used that it appears 229 times in the New Testament. In fact, Paul used it to address the naughty Christians of Corinth. He called them saints. Knowing how Paul was, he probably was taking an underhand jab at them. But nonetheless, he addressed them as saints. Our pilgrim fathers and pilgrim mothers, in fact, when they addressed each other in the public square and in church, called each other saints. So they would use it very casually as a way of acknowledging the sacredness and the potential that we all have to live in the image of Christ. But also they used it because we're all on a journey. Where none of us are perfect. So we are all saints for Christ. When it comes to honoring a saint, we are reminded by the wonderful hymn titled, I Sing the Song of the Saints of God, that the saints who God has placed in our lives come from different vocations and different backgrounds. Selected verses from this song goes as follows. I sing the song of the saints of God, patient and brave and true, who toiled and fought and lived and died for the Lord they loved and knew. And one was a doctor, and one was a queen, and one was a shepherdess on the green. They were all of them saints of God, and I mean, God help me to be one too. Right? They all come in different, different backgrounds. So the first point I wish to make this morning is that All Saints Day is a day of recollection, of remembering the people who God has placed in our lives and how they contribute to our well-being and spiritual and life enhancements. It's a day where we express our gratitude to God for placing saintly people in our lives because we wonder we would not be where we are if it were not for those people in our lives. But the second final point that I wish to make is that All Saints Day is a day of cooperation. What do I mean by that? I personally believe that God has not created us to be onlookers to his great work and that to of his servants who are deceased, but to be participants of God's work. In fact, I once read a theologian named Peter Gomes who said that without our participation in the process of building on the legacy of those who have died, their work cannot be made perfect. In Philippians chapter 4, it reads as follows. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So we're called to remember those things in our lives that were engendered by others that is right and pure and lovely and admirable. But then Paul goes on to say, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or from others, put into practice. So we're not only called to remember them, we're called to emulate the virtues that they exhibited in this lifetime, to build on their legacy by putting that into action. So we share with the saints an unfinished drama. From Genesis to Revelation, we with them are all part of God's plan to bring redemption to the world, to make this world better. So what is your part in this drama? What is your role in enhancing the values and legacy of your loved ones? And not only are we involved, but the saints now God depend in some measure of us, on us to continue that work, that unfinished work, for which they can no longer continue to toil. Now think for a moment of all the sacrifices that a saint made for our individual being. Think for a moment of the energy, time, and resources that a saint invested in us in order to help us grow into the fullness of Christ, in order to allow us to reach our goals and potential. I sincerely believe that what we're grateful of a saint, their contributions, is something that we cannot waste, but we can also not rest on their laurels. We have to continue their work. It is a community of cooperation in which the dead, the living, and the yet to be here share in that glory which is the presence of Christ and the perfect will of God. So I you think about these words, perhaps you will say to yourself, the deceased, saintly person I have in mind was committed to mental illness. So in their honor, not only will I think about them this year, 
that you know what, I'm going to make a contribution to Mental Health Awareness Day. Or I'm going to participate in a walkathon that calls attention to mental illness in their honor in order to continue to push their work. Or, as one of you shared with me recently, my deceased relative loved dogs. And thinking about something that we discussed together, I'm going to volunteer at the local animal shelter as a way of feeling his presence in my life and his involvement in taking care of God's innocent and sentient creatures. All Day Saints is about connecting us to our deceased loved ones through participation and anticipation, as we read from that passage of Revelation. We're going to see them again. We're going to encounter them again. We're going to celebrate our victory over death and illness, just like they have been able to climb, claim a crown of glory on their heads. It would be remarkable as they look into our eyes that they express to us God's faithful servants, you serve well, as a way of saying you did not waste their legacy. So to summarize, All Saints Day is about celebrating the great fellowship of the deceased, which we do today by remembering them, and by exploring how we can remain connected to them through recollection and cooperation. Amen. Now we will do two things that speak to remembrance. First, we will read the names that you have shared. We will have a brief pause and you can think about what this person means to you, how they contribute to help you live our more saintly life in Christ, and what unfinished business you have to engage in in order to honor their legacy. After we read these names, we will thank God for their presence in our lives and we will bridge over to the Lord's Supper which is an act of remembrance. Jeff Blount. Maria Arias. Dwayne Bullock. Anne Baker. Horace Baker. Joanne Besser, Alfred William Brown, Henriette Brower, Arthur Carl, Patricia Carl, Thomas Bogger Carl. Ruby Dunn, Dorothy Fistel, Jim Flugel, Maggie Flugel, Pamela Grau, Craig Henneman, Ellen Hubbard, Robert J. Catrulia, Harold Coons, Alex McKnight, Robert Knoll, Jenny Nieves, Luma Pena, Loretta Martin Radcliffe, Jose Rosario, Patricia Rust, Kay Shanley,
Mercedes Silva. Arnold Simmons, the first. Arnold Simmons, the second. Audrey Simmons. Alan Slingerland. Ray Steinkohl. Louis Streamer. Marguerite Streamer. Edwin Tirado. Hazel Voorhees. Robert Voorhees. Dennis Wentworth. Robert Williamson. Senior Esperanza and Julio Baez Marcos Scenario Lord, the names that we have shared on this list are written on the tablets of our heart. We still grieve their loss, and we hurt because we love, and because we love, we will always remember their goodness in our lives. We thank you because as a church family, you have given us a space where we feel spiritually and emotionally safe to process our feelings and share our grief knowing that you are the great comforter. We ask that we remember these loved ones fondly, that we remain inspired by their saintly qualities to do your work on this world, in this world. Heal our wounds, heal our memories. Give us hope for the future. In your name we pray for this grace. Amen. We now bridge over to the Lord's Supper. I hope you have a communion kit. Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that he was going to pass away, rented an upper room as a way of showing his love to his friends in an intimate and tangible manner, held a feast for them. He took a piece of bread, he broke it, he blessed it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same manner, our Lord took wine and poured it into one cup. And he said to his apostles, This is my blood shed for the remission of your sins. Every time you gather, do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the blood of Christ. Thank you, precious Lord, for the enduring memory of the Lord's Supper. Through it, we are connected to your sacrifice and to the upper room experience in anticipation of the day that we will all be seated at the table of the Lamb and have that great last communion supper to celebrate with our loved ones and other saints who have predeceased us victory over death and illness in this world. We thank you for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ who saves us from all sin and redeems us. You claim us as your own. Allow us to do the same thing in claiming each other as our own in Christ and through Christ and giving others the experience to feel whole and connected. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are going through health transitions. And specifically, we think about Austin Cox and Lupe Garban and Kay Simmons. And for all who we are concerned about health-wise, be with them. Continue to use doctors and nurses as agents of healing to respond to their needs with care, compassion and competency to help them reach a better place. In your name we pray, the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn.
So, as we leave this sacred space, Saints of God, I hope you embrace that title, let us go into the world thinking fondly of those who have come before us and have inspired us to grow in Christ and serve the world with love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the peace of God always govern our minds and hearts.